Let me welcome you. Let me welcome everyone to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today for a fantastic guest and incredibly important topic. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide in the next hour as we explore the fall semester with the help of a fantastic guest. Now, I'd very, very much like to welcome this week's guest. Uh, it's an absolute delight to welcome back Matt Reed. Uh, some of you may know him uh, as Dean Dad, as one of the most prolific commentators on Inside Higher Ed. Uh, Matt has been uh, running a column exploring what it means to be a dean for a long, long time, with a great mix of everything from deep experience, insight, and a great sense of humor, and even literary theory. He's the uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs at Brookdale Community College. He's previously been a guest on the program, and I, I'm just absolutely, as the British say, chuffed to bits to welcome him back. <laughs> Matt, hello, welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. Oh, well, glad to see you here. And I, I appreciate your negative space background. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I tried putting this up in front of the bookshelves, but the lighting was terrible, so oh, no. yeah. Well, this gives you kind of like 1970s vibe, maybe. You know? Yeah, it, it's kind of early political prisoner, but that's <laughs> <it's>... <laughs> well, well, if you need help, we can we can get food parcels in you. We know some of the guards. <laughs> New Jersey. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. That's too easy. Um, listen, Matt, I, I asked people to introduce themselves, and I've asked you to introduce yourself before, and, and I just gave a quick, quick sketch. Um, but l let me ask this. Um, you know, Looking ahead to the next academic year, to fall and, and spring, um, what are, you know, as you're trying to deal with this combination of massive political mobilization and pandemic, what are the say the top three or four issues that as a dean you're spending most of your time thinking about okay um i should clarify although the title of the blog is confessions of a community college dean i've actually been a vice president since 2008 oh, excuse me excuse me the, vice president, the yeah. title of the blog because dean dad has alliteration and it kind of became a brand so it just goes, it's stuck vice president dad doesn't quite uh, it. it doesn't work yeah it doesn't work as well vice president um, ops yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, in facing uh, the coming fall and, and coming year, um, the single biggest issue I think is the uncertainty. Oh. Um, over the, the mm. May and June, uh, every every Monday night in May and June, I hosted a Zoom call for folks from Brookdale, mm -hmm. called it Mondays with Matt. And every Monday night at seven, uh, I'd go online and folks would be able to come on and what I was hoping would happen was we'd have sort of an open-ended conversation and we would um, develop solutions together and sort of talk through different scenarios. What I found though was the, the desire for certainty was so strong that honest and transparent answers along the lines of, we don't know that yet, really just annoyed people. Uh, they wanted to know for certain, what is the plan for September? Tell me right now. And why are you holding back on me? And why are you not telling us everything? As if we knew. <laughs> yeah. um, it was so I, I discovered there was a, a, a difference between transparency and certainty. Mm -hmm. And that I was being transparent about the uncertainty of the situation. But they didn't like that. What they wanted was <laughs> Yeah. And so I had to, I eventually stopped doing the series because I realized I was just annoying everybody by saying, you know, we don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. Yeah. Among the considerations, um, I should clarify up front, Brookdale is a, a community college. Mm -hmm. It is a commuter school. We don't have dorms. Mm -hmm. We have no residential component at all. Mm -hmm. So that makes certain decisions a lot easier. You know, we don't have to figure out how do you handle dorms? Do you bring people back to dorms? Mm -hmm. uh, we never had dorm revenue as part of our budget. Mm -hmm. So that's a non-issue for us, which is helpful. Um, but there are plenty of other issues to work with. We have some programs for which uh, going online is relatively easy. Mm -hmm. So psychology, history, you know, poli sci, my own, my own field. Mm -hmm. um, that's fairly easy to do online. That's fairly direct. We also have automotive tech uh, where people actually mm -hmm. take apart transmissions and rebuild them. We have culinary uh, we have ceramics. These really don't lend themselves to a virtual or distant delivery. You need to get hands on. So we've had to uh, 
send a sort of nuanced and split message to the world. And it's hard to communicate nuance or split nuanced or split messages. Basically, we're doing everything virtually that can be done virtually. Right. So every liberal arts class, every math class, every anything that works online is going to be done online. But automotive will still be on campus. Mm. Uh, culinary will mm. still be on campus. Mm. Uh, not entirely. There are certain lecture components that can move online. But there are pretty inescapable hands-on pieces. So with those hands-on pieces, we've had to look at um, personal protective equipment. We've had to look at cleaning protocols, um, setting up a campus that was really built to bring people together now to keep them apart, which was never the idea. <laughs> you know, so we have to kind of work backwards. Um, an entire institution built on the notion of accessibility now has to lock down. Mm. That's not what it was built to do. It was built to be accessible. And when I say built, I mean physically. It was literally built to be accessible. There's ramps everywhere, and we just installed ADA doors, and now we have to lock them all. Mm. Um, so there's that challenge. There's also the challenge of budgetary uncertainty. Um, over the past few decades, as you well know, and you've written about at length, um, the, the burden of paying for public higher ed has shifted from the public to students, which means from an institutional perspective, enrollment fluctuations matter more. If tuition were 20% of our budget, um, an enrollment drop of 10%, yeah, you know, you can handle it. If tuition is 57% of our budget, which it is, then an enrollment drop of 20% hurts that does real damage. Um, we don't know what the enrollment picture is gonna be this fall. Uh, right now we're down from last year, although we were up in the summer. I saw uh, that, so that was good news. I'm sorry? That was good news. It is, it is, it was welcome. Um, as you know, in the Northeast, the number of 18 year olds has been dropping for a while and continues okay. to drop. So we've been on kind of a long-term slide since the peak of the Great Recession or the pit of the Great Recession, depending how you look at it. <laughs> Um, but this really is a new variable, something we have no track record of, of dealing with. Um, we don't know yet if we're going to come in lower than last year, higher than last year. Um, if I had to guess, I would say higher. I think we're going to see a kind of August run. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm basing that on the number of four-year schools that are reluctantly admitting that they really can't be in person in the fall. And we intend to be there for students who decide, well, now, wait a minute. If I'm staying home anyway, interesting, and I'm taking classes online anyway, yeah, why not pay community college tuition instead of private university tuition for the same class, which will transfer? Um, it's a pretty good value proposition. And so I'm hoping that folks start to figure that out. Um, but it is hard to hard to predict just because this is such a, a black swan event. Um, and then the other piece that you mentioned, the, the sort of racial tensions and racial um, awakening in a sense, uh, that has changed some of the discussion in a really positive way. Um, to give a couple of examples, over the past few years um, at Brookdale, I was tasked with developing the academic master plan for the college. Mm -hmm. So what are the main goals for you know the next few years? And I have a, a long-standing skepticism towards strategic planning generally, yes. because every strategic plan I'd ever been involved with or seen prior to here was a wish list. And yeah. they're about as relevant as wish lists tend to be. <laughs> and a couple of years ago, I went through a, a, a program with the Aspen Institute. Um, for future presidents. And a former president from Northern Virginia, um, Bob Templin, talked about his strategic plan and his strategic plan had one goal. And I remember raising my hand and saying, wait, you mean it can have a point? <laughs> it had literally never occurred to me because I had never seen one that did. Um, and so I thought, all right, that's a valuable lesson. So for the academic master plan, um, it, I can build, boil it down to one sentence which is the top priority for academic affairs in the next five years is the reduction or elimination of achievement gaps by race, period. And then everything else flows from that. 
And this was, we came up with that two years ago now. And that sounds sort of um, simplistic or maybe anodyne, but when you operationalize that, that means making fundamental changes to the structure of what you're doing. Um, so I, I went in with the assumption, and I think is correct, that if all you do to improve the outcomes of black students is target new help to black students, you're kind of missing the point because that assumes that the problem is that black students are somehow less than mm -hmm. and they need to be fixed. I don't buy that. <laughs> I, just, I fundamentally don't buy that. I think the issue is that we have habits and structures and practices that take a certain culture as the norm and take everyone else as sort of deviating from the norm. And then those who deviate from the norm have a harder time. So for example, in concrete terms, that means embracing open educational resources mm -hmm. as an equality initiative. Mm -hmm. because cost is a major barrier and class and race do overlap in, in predictable ways uh, or shorter courses. And this is where I really got a lot of pushback. Um, nationally, uh, the data I've seen show that seven week or eight week classes have much higher success rates than 15 week classes. Hmm. And that uh, hmm. in schools that have moved from a 15 week or 16 mm -hmm. week semester to mm -hmm. breaking it in half, mm -hmm seven or eight, uh, achievement gaps drop significantly and stay small. Hmm. And I thought, now that's kind of nifty because that's something we actually control. Yeah. We control the academic calendar. We don't need, I don't need the president of the United States to understand it. We can do it ourselves. Yeah. What I discovered though, is, um, a lot of people are very invested in the way they have always done it. Mm -hmm. And if you confront them with, but the evidence shows uh, <laughs> there are varying degrees of willingness to hear that. So, you know, I've had to kind of shrink it down, pilot it, um, which is not a great way to test that particular thesis. Um, but it, it, it gives some indication of, you know, when people talk about um, structural racism, that can be kind of hard for a lot of people to picture, you know, how mm -hmm. do you picture a structure. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, what are the structures you have to change to have less racist outcomes? Suddenly it becomes really, really clear what structural racism is. Um, something as simple as changing the academic calendar takes years and fights and there's ill will and it's a slog. It's really, really hard. There are people who don't believe they're doing anything wrong they believe quite strongly that the way they've always done it is the way it has to be. Yeah. And when you suggest, well, no, places that actually made the switch have seen these improvements, you start getting into the nitpicking. Well, that's different. You know, that school's different or our school's different. And they, there's always some difference. Um, it, it's been an education for me in seeing how do you get from a statement like, okay, racism is bad. And the vast majority of people on campus will, will buy that statement. Sure. But when you follow it with, and therefore we need to change, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you know? What do you mean change? Um, that has been eye-opening for me. And I'm hopeful that in this new post-George Floyd era in which um, it's much harder to deny um, the pervasiveness of racism that maybe we can start to make some some more headway we can get past that first level of denial um because how we need to your, uh, how is your um I, I mean i know it's summer but you 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 and, and you've you've had an uptick in enrollment but how what's your sense of the brookdale community i mean are they are they are, are parts of it activized or mobilized and active by the uh, black lives matter uh, mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, we've had over the summer, we've had a couple of sort of town meetings online. Um, the president of Brookdale, David Stout, is a psychologist by training. He's very, very good at sort of hard conversations in groups. Um, that, that's nice. one of his strengths. 
so we, we've done a couple of, of town hall meetings online and folks have, have shared some stories that were sort of shocking. Um, nothing about brutality, but, but more like um, thoughtlessness, mm -hmm. just stupid things that people would say or do, uh, hurtful things. Microaggressions. Um, I'm sorry? Microaggressions. Yeah, yeah. Um, comments about hairstyles and, you know, stupid stuff that nobody should have to deal with. Um, and I, I see that as kind of stage one, you know, if let, like let's get past pure denial or, you know, there's that sort of, um, I'm sure you read White Fragility. There's, there's this notion that as soon as you mention that a given practice has a, a racist outcome, a lot of people will immediately jump back to, wait, are you calling me racist? Mm -hmm. Well, no. <laughs> you know, personal attitudes and structural outcomes are two different things. And I think it's hard to kind of disentangle those sometimes. Well, let me let me pause just for a second and 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 say first of all, thank you. This is a fin you just we could stop now. I mean, you just gave us a fantastic you know glimpse into not your thinking, um, but also a way of thinking about how to transform uh, colleges uh, for the fall. But I want to I want to invite everybody to uh, to chime in. If you're new to the forum, uh, I'm just the MC. I'm I'm not the I'm not the speaker or the interviewer. I'm I'm the guide um, and uh, hopefully the passer honor of your questions. Um, so if you have any any questions for uh, Vice President Dean <laughs> uh, um, and uh, if you have any questions about uh, about what, what he just said, um, thinking about strategic planning, thinking about how uh, faculty can change, thinking about campus population shifts, thinking about even the semester length, the form is yours. Uh, just you reach down to that white strip and either press the uh, raise hand button if you want to join us on stage or press the question mark. And as I say that, a question just appeared, which is pretty magical. Uh, so this, let me flash this on the screen. Again, if you're new to the forum, this is how one way it works. Uh, and this is from um, Richard Burke at Casper College. He says, in terms of evidence shows, what can one do about the colleague who searches the internet simply searching for contrary evidence, no matter the credibility of that source? Hmm. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, let me put that back up. <laughs> when you figure it out, let me know. I guess my, my short answer would be, um, as a political scientist by training, no public figure has ever had a 100% approval rating ever. Hmm. Um, and hmm. so if you set that as your goal, you are bound to fail. What you need to do is figure out how do you get 51% and then win it. Um, there will be people who will object, and that's just a fact of life, but you can't let that stop you. Hmm. Uh, within higher ed, that's an almost radical proposition because there's such a um, lip service paid to the idea of consensus. But if you've ever been in some of these meetings, um, consensus is often coercive. It's often a few sort of very loud people opining at great length and with some force behind it. And a whole bunch of people going, oh God, please stop, please stop, please stop, make it stop, make it stop. And so rather than engaging, they just kind of shut down in hopes that the meeting will end. And so you wind up with you know a few sort of um, true believers winning by default, but you've never had any real deliberation. You've never had any actual um, back and forth. Add to that, um, in the context of you know years and years and years of tight budgets, um, it's hard to build trust when every single year you have to make another unpopular decision, uh, whether it's around professional development funding or course releases or class sizes or whatever. Um, it's very difficult for folks to kind of separate the person from the position. Hmm. Hmm. So there are times when a leader is put in a position where it's make the least bad choice, you know, and then you do. And then the folks who don't like the least bad choice, who didn't see what the other alternatives were, will think that you did that because you wanted to. And the reason you wanted to is you're a horrible person. And that's, I guess there are times when that's true, but in my experience, the much more common case is, um, we have a gap, we need to fill the gap. There are only so many options to fill the gap. The top five options that would get the most votes are all off the table for various reasons. What do you do? Um, and every single time you do that, it costs a little bit of goodwill. 
Mm. So it's difficult to build the kind of trust where you can say to someone with a straight face, look, I know you're not convinced, but trust me, I know what I'm doing and have them say, okay. Mm. Um, at my previous college, <clears throat> I, I got to the point where I was able to do that because we, at that moment in history, we hadn't had the, the budget hadn't fallen off the table yet. And so it was relative, it wasn't well-funded, but it was steady. So we were able to predict with some accuracy what kind of resources we had, and therefore we could actually make thoughtful decisions about how, how to allocate them. And by the time I left, I remember in, in 2015, uh, the state put, the state of Massachusetts put through a rule change about transfer that needed to be approved at each campus. And I took it to the college, um, I forget if we called it Senate, gave like a five minute presentation uh, someone asked me, so you think it's a good idea? I said, on balance, yeah. They said, okay, and they passed it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that was, you can only do that after years of building trust. But they figured out, you know, what my priorities were, where I was coming from, and they figured out, okay, if I'm saying that this makes sense academically, it probably does. Yeah. Wow. Um, at Brookdale, it's been tougher because I got here pretty much at the moment the wheels had fallen off in terms of the mm. budget. Mm. And so walking in with the best of intentions, um, there are times when it, it boils down to the least bad option. So when folks have been in, in their perception, and I, mean, I get where this comes from, they feel like they've been attacked yeah. for years. Then when you come out and say, trust me, their first response is, seriously? <laughs> you know? And so any assertion that you make is immediately contestable. And, you know, as folks who've been on the internet a while know, there's always ammunition to contest anything on the internet. There are people on the internet who tell you the earth is flat, literally. So it's, yeah. I, I agree that it can be frustrating. Um, I have felt that frustration personally. Um, but it's important to kind of step back and realize where that comes from. You know, there might be 10 or 20% of people who are contrary just because that's how they're wired. Yeah. Whatever, forget about them. Then there are folks who may not pay that much attention day to day, but who get a general sense that things are getting worse. And so they get defensive mm -hmm. and they start trying to hold on harder to what they have for fear that change equals loss. So then when you come through proposing a big change, all they see is a big loss. And, and when you try to argue, well, no, this is actually a better thing. They're just not emotionally in a space to hear that. Um, so instead I've had to go to a much more indirect route of sort of pilots and demonstration projects and sort of uh, viral transmission. You get a few early adopters, they have some success, they tell their friends, they get some success, they tell their friends. Yeah. That works really well with something like OER, where you can go course mm -hmm. by course by course. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work really well with something like the academic calendar, because that's kind of institution-wide. You know, let, let me... Let me pause you on that because because this is a right below us. There are a whole stack of questions specifically about the academic calendar, and I want to give folks a chance to share that. Richard, thank you for that great question. Um, uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, Matt, thank you for that bracing look into the hard won lessons of of how academic leadership can work. Let me. Uh, there's actually three of these in a row, so uh, let me just pop these up and. And uh, I think there may be a little overlap, but let's, let's, let's hit each of these in, a, in particular. Uh, this is William Smith, who says, it asks if you could clarify the connection between the shift to an eight-week semester and structural racism. Yes. Um, the reason that, <clears throat> I'll give you an example, Odessa College in Texas, mm -hmm. which is a community college, um, the western part of the state, went to eight-week semesters uh, about five years ago. In the time since then, the achievement gaps have dropped dramatically. What happens is instead of taking instead of a student taking four or five classes at a time for 15 weeks at a time, they'll take two at a time for seven or eight. So over the course of 15 weeks, they wind up taking the same number in total, but they're only doing two at a time instead of four or five at a time. They found that that makes the most difference for students who have um, who work a lot of hours a week for pay, who have family commitments that draw them away. And in part, and this is going to sound simplistic, but it's true. 
um, it's easier to juggle two things than to juggle four things. Oh, 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 oh. so it's not just the length, it's also taking two classes instead of four. Right, that, that's a key component of it. So at any given moment, you're only taking half as many, but you you still move through just as fast. It's just you're doing you know instead of four over four months, you two September October and then two November December. When you do that, um, the traditionally full time prepared student does the same, but the students who tend to struggle more in a traditional setting do a lot better, in the shorter setting. Part of that is because there's less opportunity for life to get in the way. Uh, anyone who works in a community college has had the experience of the hardworking student who you're rooting for, who mm -hmm. has a sudden economic emergency, the car dies, medical issue of the family, whatever, and they have to drop out. Yeah. If a student drops out in the first week of November because of life, in the traditional calendar, they've lost four or five classes. They've lost the entire semester. It's like, it's like they were never there. If you split the semester and they have to leave in early November, they've already got credit for those first two classes. They, they've got something in their back pocket. I see. So it's not a complete wipeout. They only lose two classes instead of four. They're likelier to come back because they see a point to it. Yeah. They don't have to start from the beginning all over again, which is really demoralizing. Um, it just works better. Oh, I've noticed right. when I was at, at Holyoke, um, I brought back the January intercession. They, they had gotten rid of it at one point. When I got there, I brought it back. And it was a two and a half week intensive January term. So you'd take one class. Yeah. The uh, pass rate, about 94%. Wow. For a community college, that's off the charts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's extraordinary. Yeah. Part of that was self-selection, but part of that was they only took one class. Right. So for two, two and a half weeks, whatever it was, they did one thing. They were juggling one ball. <laughs> juggling one ball is easy, you know. Yeah. It was the ability to focus. Um, that's in broad terms, and I'm using these terms very broadly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Students of color, low-income students tend to have more complicated lives outside of class in terms of jobs and families and economics. Mm -hmm. I say tend to, it's not universal, but as right. an, in the aggregate. To the extent that you can reduce the number of balls anyone has to juggle at one time, you're going to disproportionately benefit the ones who have the most complicated lives outside. That's that's fantastic. Um, in the in the chat, Amanda Burbage notes that um, someone who leaves, say in November, um, they um, they're not losing four or five tuition expenses, but only two. Um, it's true. Is, yeah, it reduces the return to Title Four, which is part of the the institutional incentive. You don't have to return as much financial aid because they finished two classes. We have um, uh, another question that follows up on that, and this is just this is just fascinating. Uh, and this is from uh, uh, John Stites at uh, Georgetown. He uh, says, "Aren't are there more externalities that have to shift before seven to eight week modules become more common? Financial aid packages, student visas, campus housing. I mean, so campus housing isn't as much of an issue, but on campus jobs and so on." Right. Yes and no. Um, Again, we're a, community, a commuter school, so campus housing is not an issue for us. Um, it does create some issues in terms of student visas and registrar, things like add drop dates have to change, um, registration policies, even things like deciding from, from a, you know, the perspective of the deans, deciding when to cancel small classes. Um, if a professor is teaching two and two or two and three or whatever, if when do you make the call on the second half class? Because if, if a first half class doesn't run, they can make it up in the second half. If a second half class doesn't run, what do they do? And that's particularly true in the spring. So there are workload issues you have to figure out. There's a lot of details, but it's been done. And in fact, in Achieving the Dream, which is a national organization, mostly of community colleges focused on mm -hmm. reducing achievement gaps, short semesters has been one of the most popular and most supported changes. Um, because it does have a greater impact on students with complicated lives. Well, that's uh, thank you for the question, uh, John. There's there's, yeah, a, there's a lot going on. Um, by the way, if you're new to the forum or to uh, the Shindig technology, those are examples of text questions. Uh, let me now show you an example of a video question, and uh, let me bring up 
um, a uh, student of mine who uh, nevertheless still uh, still talks to us in public. Um, and um, uh, they have a, a very, very good question. So let me bring up uh, Wesson uh, Radomski. Hello, Wesson. Hey there, can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfectly. Excellent. So uh, my question is following up on that influx you're expecting of students from more expensive four-year institutions who might be taking a break from those institutions this fall or entire academic year. And I'm wondering how you expect to have to shift your thinking about planning for this upcoming year to accommodate those students and whether you expect it to impact your relationships with some of those four-year institutions. I know it's Mm. Those transfer agreements are really important, mm. and I know that quite a few four-year institutions don't allow students to take courses for credit at other institutions while they're on a leave of absence. So I'm just wondering if you've been thinking about ways to navigate that and how you're thinking about this. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, I've had to deal with that directly. My son is uh, starting as a sophomore this fall at University of Virginia. He was a freshman this past year. And when they've, they've been going back and forth on how much to open up and whether they can go back. Um, when I raised the question, you know, could you take a summer course at Brookdale while you're home? Uh, he contacted UVA and discovered they won't let you transfer credits in once you've matriculated. They will let you transfer them in at the point of admission. Hmm. But once you're in, that's it. Um, I was, I'll admit I was kind of annoyed by that. Um, there are schools that do that and I, I think over time they're going to come under pressure not to because the numbers are going to change. Um, a lot of these policies were made prior to a pandemic. <coughs> they were not made with a pandemic in mind. Um, to give you an example of that, we have a pass no credit option at Brookdale, but in order to take a, a course pass fail essentially, by policy, the student has to make that decision within the first three weeks of the semester. Hmm. Now, if you remember in the spring, the pandemic hit in March. Yeah. So, you know, by the time the pandemic hit, that deadline had passed and a whole bunch of students immediately panicked and rightly so. Now, in that case, we were able to push through um, an extension. We extended it through the end of the semester. The first concern that I got from the faculty when I raised it was, will the courses transfer? And because a lot of four-year schools would not take courses with a pass as a grade. Um, if you'll remember in spring 2020, as the semester wore on, more and more schools started issuing statements saying, for this one semester, yes, we'll take passes because the world went off the tracks. Yeah. Um, I, I think over time, we're going to see something similar happen with four-year schools that right now have been holding the line against transfer credits. They've been able to do it up until now because it's been small numbers. But we're going to see big numbers of students either skipping a year entirely or doing you know community college or some variation uh, for a while and at some point the force of gravity just becomes too strong you just can't keep keep fighting it now i say that partially hoping it's true um, you're right that the, the relationships with the four-year schools can be tricky um, and they vary by state this is what <coughs> matters a lot um, there are states like florida where a lot of the community colleges have started offering four-year degrees. And so that's how they handle it. You know, it's not, a, it's no longer a transfer issue. It's just continuity. Um, in New Jersey, a few schools applied to do that. The state pushed back, the four-year schools pushed back. It was a whole thing. And they compromised on a three plus one that they allow three plus one agreements. So now you can do three years at the community college and then transfer just for the fourth year to Rutgers or wherever. And that way you're only doing one year of the four-year school tuition level. The four-year schools weren't totally thrilled with that, but they were happier with that than they would have been with us offering bachelor degrees. Uh, the reason we were able to pull that off is the cost argument is just becoming so powerful. The four-year schools have become so expensive. Student debt is such an issue. Um, it's getting harder to kind of turn up your nose at the idea of, you know, our full-time if you're a full-time student at Brookdale and you don't qualify for free community college, which many of them do, it's about $6,000 a year as opposed to 60. Right. You know, it, it becomes very difficult to hold the line against numbers like that. So I'm hoping that um, you're right in the short term, I think it's going to be um, tense. There are going to be some difficult 
conversations and not everything is going to go smoothly. In the long term, though, I think that the force of numbers is so strong. Um, I mean, Harvard can do what it wants, but outside of the top, maybe 50, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard for them to hold the line. Thank you. That's a fantastic question, Buston. Thank you very, very much. And uh, what a what a deep answer. Um, uh, as usual, I'm delighted by my students because Weston just plunged into the, the the dark matter of you know transfer credits, which is like so. That. <laughs> that's really no, that's my world. That, that I like that. Yeah, that was... yeah. Uh, well, you can use that analogy and, and enjoy it. If if so, if you're if you're new to the forum, that's that's how easily a video question works. If you'd like to follow Weston, just press the raised hand button and uh, and you can join us. Um, we have a, a, a few more text questions that uh, I want to make sure that we get in. Um, and there's one from uh, Jason Green in Arkansas. Uh, and Jason asks, uh, as regards to fall planning, do the uncertainty constrain the options available to you in the sense that by the time the uncertainty decreased, there wasn't enough time to implement? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wish I could say yes to that. It's a little bit backwards. What happened was uh, more as we came to realize just how much would be involved in running more on-site classes, it became progressively clearer that it would be overwhelming, that we just did not have the mm -hmm. infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. And so it wasn't so much that we ran out of time uh, it was more a matter of, of, as it went from abstract to concrete, and we realized, okay, how much, how much PPE do we have? How much plexiglass can we put up? How do you actually do a lecture in a room with twenty people, um, without spitting on people? Um, how would that actually work? The the more concrete we got, the more clear it became that we just weren't ready to do that at scale, and so we kind of backed into it. Um, I shared on the blog the, the the thing that really pushed me into over the edge into supporting the move to go as virtual as we possibly can was childcare. Mm. Um, our local K twelve mm. districts still mostly haven't announced what they're doing for the fall, and we're still. hearing rumors. Yeah, and it's July third, <coughs> we still don't know. Um, mm. We're hearing rumors of you know two days on, three days off, mornings, afternoons, whatever. We have a lot of students who are parents, and we have a lot of faculty and staff who are parents of school age kids. If we try to compel folks to come to campus, but their kids can't go to school because the school is closed for them that day, we create horrible childcare issues that no one has figured out how to handle. Um, and I did not want to be the one to put somebody in a position where they had to choose between their job and their kid. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do it. Oh. Um, so between the logistics and the childcare, we kind of the, the the as virtual as you can be option kind of was the only one that survived process of elimination. Well, thank you, um, and that's a that's a. I'm I'm always amazed at um, at uh, how clearly you managed to distill so many of these many complicated issues into um, into really their 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 essence here. Um, speaking of, uh, oh, you mentioned Odessa College in Texas. We have uh, another longtime friend of the forum uh, who's also in Texas, uh, who also works at the, uh, sometimes the Houston Community College System. Uh, okay. This is uh, Tom Hames, and uh, he has a question. Hello, Tom. Hello. Everybody uh, doing okay, I hope. Yeah, um, so my, I, I'm Mr. Systems Thinker, so I have a question for you in terms of those kind of systemic changes that you were, you've been discussing, like the eight-week semester um, or short, shorter-term six-week semesters. I remember early on in one of the discussions, um, I think it was the Chronicle discussion Brian was hosting. Though uh, there was discussion about you know everybody going to really short semesters as a uh, as a way of dealing with the virus, because you know the same kind of parameters that. Um, tend to impact students having interesting lives. We all have interesting lives now, as I said in the chat, right? So, uh, you know, we don't know when the next flare up's gonna come. We don't know when we're gonna have to shut down. Brian has that has a wonderful term for it called toggle term. 
Um, but um, what I'm seeing a lot of institutions, including my own, uh, doing though is is rejecting that kind of systemic change. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, my question to you is, you know, from your experience, from what you're seeing in terms of the conversations you're having, either within the college or with colleagues at other colleges, are you seeing that the um, the pandemic is providing opportunities for more systemic change or or less systemic change? Because I think both are potential uh, reactions uh, to that. So that's my question. That's a great question. Um, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a short term and a long term. In the short term, it's kind of, you know, when, when the boat is taking on water, the first thing to do is not to discuss the merits of air travel, right? The first thing to do is plug the holes in the boat. Right. So right now we're kind of at that hole plugging stage that, you know, um, oh crap, international students, what do we do? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, just the other day, for instance, uh, we have for the, for the, we're running some in progress uh, classes this summer. The, these are classes that were interrupted in the spring that have a hands-on component like automotive. They're coming in now in late summer to finish up. And we have temperature checks uh, for, before folks can get into the buildings. And before they even get to the temperature check, they have an online questionnaire they have to fill out. Um, have you been in contact with anyone with COVID? Do you have a fever? That kind of stuff. On day one, we realized it became really clear when some of the crew arrived that, oh, we forgot to put that in Spanish. <laughs> there, we've got, you know, some of the cleaning crew is Spanish speaking and they had they struggled with the English in the quiz. It, that, that kind of stuff. You know, there's a lot of very, very tactical as opposed to strategic thinking because there's just a whole lot of system stuff that, that we have to change on the fly. Um, right now with CARES Act funding, for example, uh, one of the, the, the part that goes to the institution as opposed to the part that goes to students can only be used for expenses that you would not otherwise have had except for the pandemic. So you can't just use, you can't just put it in your operating budget, which would have helped actually. Um, instead, you can only use it for new things. So you get into situations where you're trying to define you know, okay, is this expense recurring or new? It's different, but how different and why different? And so you, you spend a lot of time arguing over those things because right now we're in the stage of don't let the boat sink. Um, I think what's going to happen though, as with the previous question about transfer, once we get past the, the short-term sort of panic, and I got to tell you that the, the stress level in April and May was beyond belief. Mm -hmm. Um once that starts to subside and we start to get into a little bit more routine, then I think we're going to start discovering that, you know what? Uh, online works better than we gave it credit for. And maybe that opens up new affordances in terms of competency-based education or dual enrollment mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. workplace, you know, incumbent worker training. Things that we've kind of known, but have been sort of slow to address because there was pushed back and it wasn't urgent and there's always something else to do. It's suddenly a lot of the more dogmatic, um, William F. Buckley had this description of conservatism, stand athwart history yelling stop. You know? yeah. <laughs> Most campuses have people who, who do that for fun. Um, that, that position has become untenable. You cannot argue with a straight face this fall that we shouldn't change anything. <laughs> it's, it's just not a credible position. So now that sort of dogmatic um, conservatism is really off the table, um, that opens up space to discuss more ambitious plans, which I think is great uh, and long overdue, frankly. Um, folks who've read my stuff for years know that I've been pushing against some of these things for a long time. And I feel like for a long time, the sort of what political scientists call the Overton window was just closed. You just, you just could not get purchased on some of these things. It's starting to open now. Um, it's opening by necessity. Um, okay. I'll share with you with the part of the Odessa story. I finally met Greg Williams, who's the president of Odessa College. 
mm-hmm. uh, at one of the Aspen things. And I asked him point blank, you know, when I've tried to do this at Brookdale, I got all this pushback. How did you get it done? And he's, he said, well, the state of Texas told us if we didn't improve our enrollment in two years, they'd shut us down. And I thought, oh, I get it. They had a gun to their head. Yeah. You know, if you don't have yeah. a gun to your head, it's easy to put off these hard conversations. They had a gun to their head. In a sense, COVID is putting a gun to the head of most of higher education now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And while I would have preferred that we didn't need that, <laughs> any number of reasons, it it does open up space to try some things that were not on the table a year ago. And so, yeah, I'm of course, then we're going to have a the, vaccine uh, and the guns are going to go back in the holster, right? Maybe. And the moment it's, may pass. Maybe. Maybe. But that's, some uh, changes that's a big be longer term than that. Yeah. Tom, th- thank you for the for the great question. Um, and um, make sure you thank put you your uh, thank you your homepage in the uh, in the chat so people can see it. Ideaspaces.net. Um, you remind me uh, of uh, of the uh, great uh, Johnson quote. Um, you know, concentrates a man's mind wonderfully. The knowledge is going to be hanged in a fortnight. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, we're we're uh, we're we're almost out of time, and I want to make sure that we have. Uh, that we don't lose any questions. And we have one that came in earlier from uh, Charles Findlay at Northeastern, not too far from you. And Charles asks, going back to uh, uh, removing, uh, reducing uh, race gaps. So you mentioned one structure, shorter classic calendar change. What other structures influence outcomes, perhaps rubrics or standards? Um, Accuplacer. Uh, Accuplacer is a standardized placement test developed by the college board that has determined whether students go into remedial classes or not, uh, particularly in math. Accuplacer is not terribly accurate. Accuplacer has biased results. Accuplacer is a nightmare. I have gone Mm. on record publicly saying, die, Accuplacer, die. Um, Accuplacer dropped the ball this spring um, when we went online. Obviously, the testing center had to close. They had had sort of distance testing for a while, but then their proctoring center, their distance proctoring center went down due to COVID. So we had to move away from Accuplacer altogether to a multi-factor placement. I'm hopeful that we just stay with the multi-factor placement where we look at high school grades and we look at um, self-assessment. John Hetz out in California has done some really interesting studies showing that uh, at the community college level, students will self-place in math more accurately than a placement test will place them. Wow. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> and anyone who, who knows the literature on remediation knows that remediation has been disproportionately uh, negative. It has hurt students of color and low-income students more than it has hurt white students and upper-income students. But it hurts most people who take it. Uh, and it's the, the time and the expense. Hmm. Um, so to the extent that we can get away from that, that we can stop mistaking false precision for academic integrity. Um, (laughs) I think that we can actually open things up and improve outcomes. Uh, I take a good hard look at some of our financial aid policies. Uh, They are complicated and I I have huge respect for the folks who work in financial aid because wow, those rules are complicated and they change quickly. Um, but to the extent that we can get away from some of the sillier financial aid rules that get in the way, that would be wonderful. Um, better transfer would help. Uh, there's been all kinds of studies done on credit loss when students transfer from community colleges to four-year schools. And again, given that community colleges are more racially diverse than the average four-year school, uh, credit loss upon transfer tends to impact disproportionately students of color. The great thing about looking at Uh, racism, if this is a great thing, is that there's no shortage of it. Um, There's plenty to be done. There's there's no shortage of work. I'm I'm not concerned that two years from now the master plan will be obsolete. Um, That's not a worry. Well, you know, you know, I I like to um, I like to close each forum session by thinking about the future um, further ahead. And you just did that perfectly. Um, you know, thinking two years ahead, and, and Tom helped prime us for this with the yeah. possibility of a vaccine and what could, what could happen afterwards. Um, you know, um, we're at the top of the hour, and and you've you've just been fantastic, giving us a, a master class and thoughtful 
um, administration. Um, I, I ask people all the time how to keep up with people, and I, I tell them, well, read Inside Higher Ed, and, uh, read Confessions of a Community College Dean, and there's there's Matt Reed. He'll be all over the place. Um, is, is that the, that's still the best place to find you? Yeah. Well, um, thank you. Thank you again so much. Um, and uh, I'm really, I'm all best for uh, this fall and uh, all best putting the good fight for community colleges, the biggest sector of American higher education. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And stay safe. <laughs> you too. Thank I will. you, everybody. I will. Uh, but don't go away, friends, because we have um, uh, just a couple of notes about the next few weeks. And I want to thank everybody uh, uh, for all their great questions by uh, video and by chat. Um, and Sarah will have a recording up soon. Uh, just looking ahead, uh, for the next couple of months, we're going to have uh, more discussion about Black Lives Matter, about fall planning, more on improving teaching, on public universities, how to do video well, more and more topics coming up as the fall semester draws closer and closer. Now, if you want to talk about this and keep discussing it, please head to our different social media venues. Uh, we have groups on LinkedIn and Facebook. We have a Slack group, but also especially uh, Twitter. In fact, um, on Twitter right now, uh, it looks like um, uh, Tim Robbins went and tweeted a great, great screenshot from the Odessa College plan, um, which is really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, if you'd also uh, like to dive back into the past sessions, for example, uh, a recent session, we looked at Beloit College as they moved from the 15-week semester to seven and a half week blocks. Just head to our archive. We have almost 220 videos there right now. Just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, please, everybody, thank you for thinking together with us. Thank you so much for all of your uh, all of your reflections and all for all of your uh, ways of being together. Um, this is the best way forward. Uh, in the meantime, everybody, please take care, stay safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye.